Chapter 8 Mr. Goyodkin woke up next morning at eight o'clock as usual. As soon as he was awake, he recalled all the adventures of the previous evening, and frowned as he recalled them. Ugh, I did play the fool last night, he thought, sitting up and glancing at his visitor's bed. But what was his amazement when he saw in the room no trace, not only of his visitor, but even of the bed on which his visitor had slept? What does it mean? Mr. Goyodkin almost shrieked. What can it be? What does this new circumstance portend? While Mr. Goyodkin was gazing in open-mouthed bewilderment at the empty spot, the door creaked and Petrushka came in with the tea-tray. "'Where? Where?' our hero said in a voice hardly audible, pointing to the place which had been occupied by his visitor the night before. At first Petrushka made no answer and did not look at his master, but fixed his eyes upon the corner to the right, till Mr. Goyodkin felt compelled to look into that corner too. After a brief silence, however, Petrushka, in a rude and husky voice, answered that his master was not at home. "'You idiot! Why, I'm your master, Petrushka!' said Mr. Goyodkin in a breaking voice, looking open-eyed at his servant. Petrushka made no reply, but he gave Mr. Goyodkin such a look that the latter crimsoned to his ears, looked at him with such an insulting reproachfulness almost equivalent to open abuse. Mr. Goyodkin was utterly flabbergasted, as the saying is. At last Petrushka explained that the other one had gone away an hour and a half ago, and would not wait. His answer, of course, sounded truthful and probable. It was evident that Petrushka was not lying, that his insulting look and the phrase the other one employed by him were only the result of the disgusting circumstance with which he was already familiar, but still he understood, though dimly, that something was wrong, and that destiny had some other surprise, not altogether a pleasant one, in store for him. "'All right, we shall see,' he thought to himself. "'We shall see in due time. We'll get to the bottom of all this. "'Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us,' he moaned in conclusion, in quite a different voice. "'And why did I invite him? To what end did I do all that?' Why, I am thrusting my head into their thievish noose myself. I am tying the noose with my own hands. Ach, you fool, you fool! You can't resist babbling like some silly boy, some chancery clerk, some wretched creature of no class at all, some rag, some rotten dish-clout. You're a gossip, an old woman. Oh, all ye saints! And he wrote verses, the rogue, and expressed his love for me. How good! How can I show him the door in a polite way if he turns up again, the rogue? Of course, there are all sorts of ways and means. I can say this is how it is, my salary being so limited, or scare him off in some way, saying that, taking this and that into consideration, I am forced to make clear that he would have to pay an equal share of the cost of board and lodging, and pay the money in advance. Hmm. No, damn it all, no, that would be degrading to me. It's not quite delicate. Couldn't I do something like this? Suggest to Petrushka that he should annoy him in some way, should be disrespectful, be rude, and get rid of him in that way. Set them at each other in some way. No, damn it all, no, it's dangerous, and again, if one looks at it from that point of view, it's not the right thing at all. Not the right thing at all. But there, even if he doesn't come, it will be a bad lookout, too. I babbled to him last night. Ack, it's a bad lookout, a bad lookout. Ack, we're in a bad way. Oh, I'm a cursed fool, a cursed fool. You can't train yourself to behave as you ought. You can't conduct yourself reasonably. Well, what if he comes and refuses? And God grant he may come. 
I should be very glad if you did come. Such were Mr. Golyodkin's reflections as he swallowed his tea and glanced continually at the clock on the wall. It's a quarter to nine. It's time to go. And something will happen. What will there be there? I should like to know exactly what lies hidden in this that is the object, the aim, and the various intrigues. It would be a good thing to find out what all these people are plotting and what will be their first step. Mr. Golyodkin could endure it no longer. He threw down his unfinished pipe, dressed, and set off for the office, anxious to ward off the danger if possible, and to reassure himself about everything by his presence in person. There was danger. He knew himself that there was danger. We, we'll get to the bottom of it, said Mr. Golyodkin, taking off his coats and galoshes in the entry. We'll go into all these matters immediately. Making up his mind to act in this way, our hero put himself to rights, assumed a correct and official air, and was just about to pass into the adjoining room, when suddenly in the very doorway he jostled against his acquaintance of the day before, his friend and companion. Mr. Golyodkin, Jr. seemed not to notice Mr. Golyodkin, Sr., though they met almost nose to nose. Mr. Golyodkin, Jr. seemed to be busy, to be hastening somewhere, was breathless. He had such an official, such a business-like air, that it seemed as though anyone could read in his face, entrusted with a special commission. "'Oh, it's you, Yakov Petrovitch,' said our hero, clutching the hand of his last night's visitor. "'Presently, presently, excuse me, tell me about it afterwards.' cried Mr. Golyodkin, Jr., dashing on. "'But excuse me, I believe, Yakov Petrovich, you wanted. "'What is it? Make haste and explain.' At this point his visitor of the previous night halted, as though reluctantly and against his will, and put his ear almost to Mr. Golyodkin's nose. "'I must tell you, Yakov Petrovich, that I am surprised at behavior. "'behavior which seemingly I could not have expected at all. "'There's a proper form for everything. "'Go to His Excellency's secretary "'and then appeal in the proper way to the directors of the office. "'Have you got your petition?' "'You! I really don't know, Yakov Petrovich. "'You simply amaze me, Yakov Petrovich. "'You certainly don't recognize me, "'or, with your characteristic gaiety, you are joking.' "'Oh, it's you,' said Mr. Goyadkin, Jr., seeming only now to recognize Mr. Goyadkin, Sr. "'So, it's you. Well, have you had a good night?' Then, smiling a little, a formal and conventional smile, by no means the sort of smile that was befitting, for, after all, he owed a debt of gratitude to Mr. Goyadkin, Sr., Smiling this formal and conventional smile, Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. added that he was very glad Mr. Goyadkin, Sr. had had a good night. Then he made a slight bow, and shuffling a little with his feet, looked to the right and to the left, then dropped his eyes to the floor, made for the side door, and, muttering in a hurried whisper that he had a special commission, dashed into the next room. He vanished like an apparition. "'Well, this is queer,' muttered our hero, petrified for a moment. "'This is queer. This is a strange circumstance.' At this point Mr. Goyadkin felt as though he had pins and needles all over him. "'However,' he went on to himself as he made his way to his department, "'however, I spoke long ago of such a circumstance.' I had a presentiment long ago that he had a special commission. Why, I said yesterday that the man must certainly be employed on some special commission. Have you finished copying out the document you had yesterday, Yakov Petrovich? Anton Antonovich Satochkin asked Mr. Goyadkin when the latter was seated beside him. Have you got it here? 
Yes, murmured Mr. Gulyadkin, looking at the head clerk with a rather helpless glance. That's right. I mention it because Andrei Filipovitch has asked for it twice. I'll be bound His Excellency wants it. Yes, it's finished. Well, that's all right, then. I believe, Anton Antonovitch, I have always performed my duties properly. I'm always scrupulous over the work entrusted to me by my superiors, and I attend to it conscientiously. Yes, why, what do you mean by that? I mean nothing, Anton Antonovitch. I only want to explain, Anton Antonovitch, that I... That is, I meant to express that spite and malice sometimes spare no person, whatever in their search for their daily and revolting food. Excuse me, I don't quite understand you. What person are you alluding to? I only meant to say, Anton Antonovitch, that I'm seeking the straight path, and I scorn going to work in a roundabout way that I am not one to intrigue, and that, if I may be allowed to say so, I may very justly be proud of it. Yes, that's quite so, and to the best of my comprehension I thoroughly endorse your remarks. But allow me to tell you, Yakov Petrovitch, that personalities are not quite permissible in good society. "'that I, for instance, am ready to put up with anything behind my back, "'for every one's abused behind his back, "'but to my face, if you please, my good sir, "'I don't allow any one to be impudent. "'I've gone grey in government service, sir, "'and I don't want any one to be impudent to me in my old age.' "'No, Anton Antonovitch, you see, Anton Antonovitch, you haven't quite caught my meaning. To be sure, Anton Antonovitch, I, for my part, could only think it an honor. Well, then, I ask your pardon, too. We've been brought up in the old school, and it's too late for us to learn your new-fangled ways. I believe we've had understanding enough for the service of our country up to now. As you are aware, sir, I have an order of merit for twenty-five years' irreproachable service. I feel it, Anton Antonovitch, on my side, too. I quite feel all that. But I don't mean that. I am speaking of a mask, Anton Antonovitch. A mask? Again, you... I am apprehensive that you are taking this, too, in a wrong sense. That is the sense of my remarks, as you say yourself, Anton Antonovitch. I am simply enunciating a theory. That is, I am advancing the idea, Anton Antonovitch, that persons who wear a mask have become far from uncommon, and that nowadays it is hard to recognize the man beneath the mask. Well, do you know, it's not altogether so hard. Sometimes it's fairly easy. Sometimes one need not go far to look for it. No, you know, Anton Antonovitch, I say, I say of myself that I, for instance, do not put on a mask except when there is need of it. That is simply at carnival time or at some festive gathering, speaking in the literal sense, but that I do not wear a mask before people in daily life, speaking in another less obvious sense. That's what I meant to say, Anton Antonovitch. Oh, well, but we must drop all this, for now I've no time to spare, said Anton Antonovitch, getting up from his seat and collecting some papers in order to report upon them to His Excellency. Your business, as I imagine, will be explained in due course without delay. You will see for yourself whom you should censure and whom you should blame, and thereupon I humbly beg you to spare me from further private explanations and arguments which interfere with my work. No, Anton Antonovitch, Mr. Goyadkin, turning a little pale, began to the retreating figure of Anton Antonovitch. I had no thought of the kind. "'What does it mean?' our hero went on to himself when he was left alone. 
What quarter is the wind in now, and what is one to make of this new turn? At the very time when our bewildered and half-crushed hero was setting himself to solve this new question, there was a sound of movement and bustle in the next room. The door opened and Andrei Filipovitch, who had been on some business in His Excellency's study, appeared breathless in the doorway and called to Mr. Glyadkin. Knowing what was wanted and anxious not to keep Andrei Filipovitch waiting, Mr. Goyadkin leapt up from his seat, and as was fitting, immediately bustled for all he was worth, getting the manuscript that was required, finally neat and ready, and preparing to follow the manuscript and Andrei Filipovitch into His Excellency's study. Suddenly, almost slipping under the arm of Andrei Filipovitch, who was standing right in the doorway, Mr. Golyadkin, Jr., darted into the room in breathless haste and bustle with a solemn and resolutely official air. He bounded straight up to Mr. Golyadkin, Sr., who was expecting nothing less than such a visitation. "'The papers, Yakov Petrovitch, the papers. His Excellency has been pleased to ask for them. Have you got them ready?' Mr. Goyadkin Sr.'s friend whispered in a hurried undertone, "'Andrei Filipovitch is waiting for you.' "'I know he is waiting without your telling me,' said Mr. Goyadkin Sr., also in a hurried whisper. "'No, Yakov Petrovitch, I did not mean that. I did not mean that at all, Yakov Petrovitch, not that at all. I sympathize with you, Yakov Petrovitch, and am moved by genuine interest.' which I most humbly beg you to spare me. Allow me, allow me. You'll put it in an envelope, of course, Yakov Petrovitch, and you'll put a mark in the third page. Allow me, Yakov Petrovitch. If you allow me, if you please. But I say there's a blot here, Yakov Petrovitch. Did you know there was a blot here? At this point Andrei Filipovitch called Yakov Petrovitch a second time. One moment, Andrei Filipovitch, I'm only just... Do you understand Russian, sir? It would be best to take it out with a penknife, Yakov Petrovitch. You had better rely upon me. You had better not touch it yourself, Yakov Petrovitch. Rely upon me. I'll do it with a penknife. Andrei Filipovitch called Mr. Goyadkin a third time. But allow me, where's the blot? I don't think there's a blot at all. It's a huge blot. Here it is. Here, allow me. I saw it here. You just let me, Yakov Petrovitch. I'll just touch it with the penknife. I'll scratch it out with the penknife from true-hearted sympathy. There, like this. See, it's done. At this point, and quite unexpectedly, Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. overpowered Mr. Goyadkin, Sr. in the momentary struggle that had arisen between them. And so, entirely against the latter's will, suddenly, without rhyme or reason, took possession of the document required by the authorities. And instead of scratching it out with the penknife and true-hearted sympathy, as he had perfidiously promised Mr. Goyadkin, Sr., hurriedly rolled it up, put it under his arm, in two bounds was beside Andrei Filipovitch, who noticed none of his maneuvers, and flew with the latter into the director's room. Mr. Goyadkin remained as though riveted to the spot, holding the penknife in his hand, and apparently on the point of scratching something out with it. Our hero could not yet grasp his new position. He could not at once recover himself. He felt the blow, but thought that it was somehow all right. In terrible, indescribable misery, he tore himself at last from his seat, rushed straight to the director's room, imploring heaven on the way that it might somehow all be arranged satisfactorily, and so would be all right. In the furthermost room, which adjoined the director's private room, he ran straight upon Andrei Filipovitch in company with his namesake. Both of them were coming back. Mr. Goyadkin moved aside. 
Andrei Filipovitch was talking with a good-humoured smile. Mr. Goyadkin Sr.'s namesake was smiling, too, fawning upon Andrei Filipovitch and tripping about at a respectful distance from him, and was whispering something in his ear with a delighted air, to which Andrei Filipovitch assented with a gracious nod. In a flash our hero grasped the whole position— the fact was that the work had surpassed His Excellency's expectations, as he learnt afterwards, and was finished punctually by the time it was needed. His Excellency was extremely pleased with it. It was even said that His Excellency had said thank you to Mr. Golgodkin, Jr., had thanked him warmly, had said that he would remember it on occasion, and would never forget it. Of course, the first thing Mr. Golyadkin did was to protest, to protest with the utmost vigor of which he was capable. Pale as death, and hardly knowing what he was doing, he rushed up to Andrei Filipovitch. But the latter, hearing that Mr. Golyadkin's business was a private matter, refused to listen, observing firmly that he had not a minute to spare even for his own affairs. The curtness of his tone and his refusal struck Mr. Golyadkin. "'I had better, perhaps, try in another quarter. I had better appeal to Anton Antonovitch.' But to his disappointment, Anton Antonovitch was not available either. He, too, was busy over something somewhere. Ah, it was not without design that he asked me to spare him explanation and discussion, thought our hero. This was what the old rogue had in his mind. In that case I shall simply make bold to approach his excellency. Still pale and feeling that his brain was in a complete ferment, greatly perplexed as to what he ought to decide to do, Mr. Goyadkin sat down on the edge of the chair. It would have been a great deal better if it had all been just nothing, he kept incessantly thinking to himself. Indeed, such mysterious business was utterly improbable. In the first place, it was nonsense, and secondly, it could not happen. Most likely it was imagination, or something else happened, and not what really did happen. Or perhaps I went myself, and somehow mistook myself for someone else. In short, it's an utterly impossible thing. Mr. Goyadkin had no sooner made up his mind that it was an utterly impossible thing than Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. flew into the room with papers in both hands as well as under his arm. Saying two or three words about business to Andrei Filipovitch as he passed, exchanging remarks with one, polite greetings with another, and familiarities with the third, Mr. Goyadkin, Jr., having apparently no time to waste, seemed on the point of leaving the room. But luckily for Mr. Goyadkin, Sr., he stopped near the door to say a few words as he passed two or three clerks who were at work there. Mr. Goyadkin, Sr. rushed straight at him. As soon as Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. saw Mr. Goyadkin, Sr.'s movement, he began immediately with great uneasiness, looking about him to make his escape. But our hero already held his last night's guest by the sleeve. The clerks surrounding the two titular counsellors stepped back and waited with curiosity to see what would happen. The senior titular counsellor realized that public opinion was not on his side. He realized that they were intriguing against him which made it all the more necessary to hold his own now. The moment was a decisive one. "'Well,' said Mr. Goyadkin, Jr., looking rather impatiently at Mr. Goyadkin, Sr. The latter could hardly breathe. "'I don't know,' he began, "'in what way to make plain to you the strangeness of your behavior, sir.' "'Well, go on.' At this point, Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. turned round and winked to the clerks standing round, as though to give them to understand that a comedy was beginning. 
The impudence and shamelessness of your manners with me, sir, in the present case, unmasks your true character, better than any words of mine could do. Don't rely on your trickery. It is worthless. Come, Yakov Petrovitch, tell me now, how did you spend the night? answered Mr. Golyadkin, Jr., looking Mr. Golyadkin, Sr., straight in the eye. "'You forget yourself, sir,' said the titular counsellor, completely flabbergasted, hardly able to feel the floor under his feet. "'I trust that you will take a different tone.' "'My darling!' exclaimed Mr. Golyadkin, Jr., making a rather unseemly grimace at Mr. Golyadkin, Sr., and suddenly, quite unexpectedly, under the pretense of caressing him, he pinched his chubby cheek with two fingers. Our hero grew as hot as fire. As soon as Mr. Golyadkin, Jr. noticed that his opponent, quivering in every limb, speechless with rage, as red as a lobster, and exasperated beyond all endurance, might actually be driven to attack him, he promptly and in the most shameless way hastened to be beforehand with his victim. Patting him two or three times on the cheek, tickling him two or three times, playing with him for a few seconds in this way, while his victim stood rigid and beside himself with fury to the no little diversion of the young men standing round, Mr. Golyadkin, Jr., ended with a most revolting shamelessness by giving Mr. Golyadkin, Sr., a poke in his rather prominent stomach, and with a most venomous and suggestive smile said to him, "'Your mischievous brother, Yakov, you are mischievous. We'll be sly, you and I, Yakov Petrovitch, we'll be sly. Then, and before our hero could gradually come to himself after the last attack, Mr. Golyadkin, Jr., with a little smile beforehand to the spectators standing round, suddenly assumed a most businesslike, busy and official air, dropped his eyes to the floor, and— drawing himself in, shrinking together, and pronouncing rapidly, On a special commission, he cut a caper with his short leg, and darted away into the next room. Our hero could not believe his eyes, and was still unable to pull himself together. At last he roused himself. Recognizing in a flash that he was ruined, in a sense annihilated, that he had disgraced himself and sullied his reputation, that he had been turned into ridicule and treated with contempt in the presence of spectators, that he had been treacherously insulted by one whom he had looked on only the day before as his greatest and most trustworthy friend, that he had been put to utter confusion. Mr. Goyadkin Sr. rushed in pursuit of his enemy. At the moment he would not even think of the witnesses of his ignominy. "'They're all in a conspiracy together,' he said to himself. "'They stand by each other and set each other on to attack me.' After taking a dozen steps, however, our hero perceived clearly that all pursuit would be vain and useless, and so he turned back. "'You won't get away.' he thought, you will get caught one day, the wolf will have to pay for the sheep's tears. With ferocious composure and the most resolute determination, Mr. Goyadkin went up to his chair and sat down upon it. You won't escape, he said again. Now it was not a question of passive resistance. There was determination and pugnacity in the air, and any one who had seen how Mr. Goyadkin at that moment, flushed and scarcely able to restrain his excitement, stabbed his pen into the inkstand, and with what fury he began scribbling on the paper, could be certain beforehand that the matter would not pass off like this and could not end in a simple, womanish way. 
In the depth of his soul he formed a resolution, and in the depth of his heart swore to carry it out. To tell the truth, he still did not quite know how to act, or rather did not know at all, but never mind, that did not matter. Imposture and shamelessness do not pay nowadays, sir. Imposture and shamelessness, sir, lead to no good, but lead to the halter. Grishka Otrepyov was the only one, sir, who gained by imposture, deceiving the blind people, and even that not for long. In spite of this last circumstance, Mr. Goyadkin proposed to wait till such time as the mask should fall from certain persons, and something should be made manifest. For this it was necessary, in the first place, that office hours should be over as soon as possible, until then our hero proposed to take no step. Then, when office hours were over, he would take one step. He knew then how he must act after taking that step, how to arrange his whole plan of action to abase the horn of arrogance and crush the snake gnawing the dust in contemptible impotence, to allow himself to be treated like a rag used for wiping dirty boots, Mr. Goyadkin could not. He could not consent to that, especially in the present case. Had it not been for that last insult, our hero might have, perhaps, brought himself to control his anger. He might, perhaps, have been silent, have submitted and not have protested too obstinately, he would have just disputed a little, have made a slight complaint, have proved that he was in the right. Then he would have given way a little. Then, perhaps, he would have given way a little more. Then he would have come round altogether. Then, especially when the opposing party solemnly admitted that he was right, perhaps he would have overlooked it completely, would even have been a little touched. There might even, perhaps, who could tell, spring up a new, close, warm friendship on an even broader basis than the friendship of last night, so that this friendship might, in the end, completely eclipse the unpleasantness of the rather unseemly resemblance of the two individuals, so that both the titular counsellors might be highly delighted, and might go on living till they were a hundred and so on. To tell the whole truth, Mr. Goyadkin began to regret a little that he had stood up for himself and his rights, and had at once come in for unpleasantness in consequence. Should he give in, thought Mr. Goyadkin, say he was joking, I would forgive him. I would forgive him even more if he would acknowledge it aloud. But I won't let myself be treated like a rag and I have not allowed even persons very different from him to treat me so, still less will I permit a depraved person to attempt it. I am not a rag. I am not a rag, sir. In short, our hero made up his mind. You're in fault yourself, sir, he thought. He made up his mind to protest, and to protest with all his might to the very last. That was the sort of man he was. He could not consent to allow himself to be insulted, still less to allow himself to be treated as a rag, and above all to allow a thoroughly vicious man to treat him so. No quarrelling, however, no quarrelling. Possibly if someone wanted, if someone, for instance, actually insisted on turning Mr. Goyadkin into a rag, he might have done so, might have done so without opposition or punishment. Mr. Goyadkin was himself conscious of this at times, and he would have been a rag and not Goyadkin. Yes, a nasty, filthy rag. But that rag would not have been a simple rag. It would have been a rag possessed of dignity. It would have been a rag possessed of feelings and sentiments, even though dignity was defenseless and feelings could not assert themselves and lay hidden deep down in the filthy folds of the rag. Still the feelings were there. The hours dragged on incredibly slowly. At last it struck four. Soon after, all got up and, following the head of the department, moved each on his homeward way. 
Mr. Goyadkin mingled with the crowd. He kept a vigilant lookout and did not lose sight of the man he wanted. At last our hero saw that his friend ran up to the office attendants who handed the clerks their overcoats and hung about near them, waiting for his in his usual nasty way. The minute was a decisive one. Mr. Goyadkin forced his way somehow through the crowd and, anxious not to be left behind, he too began fussing about his overcoat. But Mr. Goyadkin's friend and companion was given his overcoat first, because on this occasion, too, he had succeeded, as he always did, in making up to them, whispering something to them, cringing upon them and getting round them. After putting on his overcoat, Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. glanced ironically at Mr. Goyadkin, Sr., acting in this way openly and defiantly looked about him with his characteristic insolence. Finally he tripped to and fro among the other clerks, no doubt in order to leave a good impression on them, said a word to one, whispered something to another, respectfully accosted a third, directed a smile at a fourth, gave his hand to a fifth, and gaily darted downstairs. Mr. Goyadkin Sr. flew after him, and to his inexpressible delight, overtook him on the last step, and seized him by the collar of his overcoat. It seemed as though Mr. Goyadkin, Jr. was a little disconcerted, and he looked about him with a helpless air. "'What do you mean by this?' he whispered to Mr. Goyadkin at last in a weak voice. "'Sir, if you are a gentleman, I trust that you remember our friendly relations yesterday,' said our hero. "'Ah, oh, yes. Well, did you sleep well?' Fury rendered Mr. Goyadkin Sr. speechless for a moment. "'I slept well, sir, but allow me to tell you, sir, that you are playing a very complicated game.' "'Who says so? My enemies say that.' answered abruptly the man who called himself Mr. Goyadkin, and saying this he unexpectedly freed himself from the feeble hand of the real Mr. Goyadkin. As soon as he was free he rushed away from the stairs, looked around him, saw a cab, ran up to it, got in, and in one moment vanished from Mr. Goyadkin Sr.'s sight. The despairing titular councillor, abandoned by all, gazed about him, but there was no other cab. He tried to run, but his legs gave way under him. With a look of open-mouthed astonishment on his countenance, feeling crushed and shriveled up, he leaned helplessly against a lamp-post, and remained so for some minutes in the middle of the pavement. It seemed as though all were over for Mr. Goyadkin. Breaking in There are a couple of obscure references in this chapter, but one in particular deserves mention, which is the historical allusion to Grushka Otrepiov. Otrepiov was the first of three men who falsely claimed to be the son of Ivan IV, or the first false Dmitri. This event is often referred to in Russian literature and bears some resemblance to the current plot line. End of comments.